Here she is. And my camera is the wrong way around immediately. One second. <laughs> She's red. And I'm loving it. I'm sure there's a slaying thing going on there somewhere. <laughs> Hello. Hi, this is my first ever Instagram live, so I'm very sorry. Oh, if is it? Yeah, I've you never you teaching me how to do it. Not even close. Like, Not even you know, close. All right. Let me move mine back so we can see the top of my head as well as my sofa. Um, right, I'm so excited about this one. I'm going to start with my intro. Good afternoon, everybody. Today, we're going to be chatting about how to make the most out of lockdown. Or, as our special guest would say, how to slay in lockdown. Um, our special guest today is Yomi Adegoke. Hello, with her red background. And um, now, Yomi has been with Albright from the very start as a member of our London clubs. And she is also a faculty member of the Albright Academy. So she's team Albright and we love her. Uh, and if that isn't all, last month, she was a guest panelist for our International Women's Day event um, with one of our partners, Keds. She is a multi-award winning journalist who is currently the woman's columnist at The Guardian and a columnist in the iPaper. And she is, of course, the eponymous co-author of the best-selling book, Slay in Your Lane, The Black Girl Bible. Hello, welcome. Um, Hi. Now, um, what I wanted to chat a bit about today, I think is the thing that we all are talking about, thinking about, and I would love your perspective on, um, which is with the coronavirus pandemic and the world in lockdown, and you and I both in our living rooms, it feels like almost everything is off limits. And our normal daily routines, like the flat white, chatting to colleagues, even doing our makeup, it has completely changed. But the world goes on and many people, like us at Albright, are looking for inspiration. Um, we're looking to create content, we're finding new ways to engage. So how are you coping? How is it? What's it like in your behind the red curtain? You know, frame it a little bit for us in terms of your experience. I would say coping, coping is quite a strong word. <laughs> <laughs> honestly speaking I have been quite honestly all over the place um I think it's quite visible I've bleached my eyebrows which was a moment of pure madness and boredness <laughs> because I just had absolutely nothing to do essentially so I've done all kinds of things can we like, just talk beauty we don't normally do this particular all right but show me your nails oh you know what they're actually not bad they're, these are my real nails and I've had and I've been taking excellent care of them because I've had nothing of substance to do so this is the how first time i've this off how did it come off i can't get mine off oh no these these are my real nails i just i just um grew them back out so i normally wear um really god like tacky press on nails that are they look great but they're very difficult to um maintain they tend to pop off after a few days but then because i've been in lockdown i've just been like you know i'm gonna grow my nails back out and file them and make them look like nice little you know french manis so yeah they're not they're not doing too badly but, um, my hair's a mess um, i shaved it myself i bought a pair of clippers i messed up my hairline <laughs> i shouldn't really be showing you the details no, it's looking awesome to us but it's good to hear everyone's noticing i see i noticed i've got god no I this have. is what I'm, makeup on, I'm trying to like you know detract from the bits of me that <laughs> i'm bleaching my hair tomorrow as well so i'm clearly going through um something <laughs> at the moment in terms of lockdown but it's been i don't know i'd say it's been a weirdly productive time in okay. some way and in other ways completely stagnant um yeah it's been a weird one for sure very surreal have you kept to a routine what what's the normal routine because you're a renaissance woman um, in that you do lots of different things. So give us the normal life and then how is that changing now? Well, I'd say that's probably the biggest change is that my normal life I do something different normally every single day. Um, yes. I'm based in Croydon and will usually go to Central at least three to four times a week to do something very different. Um, there'll usually be a meeting about something, a talk I'm attending in the evening, um, just lots of different things. And now since lockdown, it's just been back to back um monotony um except i suppose 
the time that I wake up, which can vary from sort of 3 a.m. to 3 p.m. That's like kind of the biggest variance in my day at the moment is when I'm getting up. But um, yeah, like normally, you know, variety is the spice of life. I'm always doing something different. And at the moment, I'm just, there has been quite a lot of repetition. But then that repetition has been useful because it's been keeping me um, from, I suppose, losing my mind. So I've bought a weighted hula hoop. My Amazon basket's a complete mess just with all these miscellaneous Give things. It's a range. It's very, very to weighted hula hoop. Oh my God, clippers to weighted hula hoops to lilac, um, what's the word, the hair dye that I've got over there that I'll be using That's tomorrow. Right. Remixed. So, yeah, I have a mini routine, I suppose. Yeah. And are you feeling frustrated? Are you feeling productive? Are you feeling all of that in one day? Because... It, and we'll get on to trot through your different accomplishments and I think what we can you know what you can share about how you've done what you've done which has been done sort of reasonably unconventionally I think yeah um, so for someone who's obviously a woman of action and a creative thinker how how does it feel right now emotionally I think it feels um it's it's a mix because I feel on one part I feel almost guilty for complaining I mean I'm healthy um I haven't lost I mean I've I did lose quite a you know significant amount of work um in March because it was International Women's Month and that's kind of like <laughs> frankly speaking like big business in terms of Christmas talks. for you yes. Emma. that and Black History Month <laughs> like, that's what I have <laughs> <in. laughs> so you know it was quite quite a blow in that sense but I'm healthy um my family's healthy so I you know I feel very grateful in that sense but then at the same time, I, you know, and everyone's going through it at the same time, but I do really feel like, damn, like I just was about to get my shit together just before this started. I know everyone feels like that, but I'm like, things were, things were kind of going all right. I had a lot of things to be thrilled to announce about and loads of them, <laughs> loads of them have fallen through now. So it's been, um, you know, it's been, it's been mixed. I mean, I've definitely taken it as an opportunity. I love art and painting and I'm one of those annoying people that's been uploading shitloads of artwork that I've created during this period and sort of getting into my creative groove in that way but then I guess on a more kind of career level it just feels like you know when Beyonce is like world stop and then it's like we're all kind of waiting for the carry on bit <laughs> I'm just kind of here like so when does this all resume um yeah. so yeah it's frustrating but I almost feel bad saying that because um I'm very lucky to have um have not had coronavirus to not have anyone that's been personally medically affected so it's kind of like a weird mix at the moment um yeah it's just, it's frustrating but also how frustrated can I be when I'm not a key worker or when I'm not somebody that's sort of out there on the front line but then at the same time you still kind of feel like like life is it's it's difficult because you know things are hard for everybody but it's, it doesn't mean that it's still that you're still not going through it, if that makes sense. It's just in a completely different way. So you kind of have to just always remind yourself that, like, yes, other people do have it harder. So I know that's a very convoluted way of answering what you said. But, <laughs> but yeah. yeah, it's a mixed bag. And so as a mistress of reinvention, um, and for our Albright community and the sisterhood who are, are listening to this, is this the time to reframe your career, to restart your career, to think about, you know, what, what can we do or take from this time based on your experience of, of changing up who you are and what you do, you know, all the time? Sure. Um, God, that's a really good question. I think it, I think it honestly depends. Um, I think being a journalist, I am used to redundancies and things just generally collapsing because um, <laughs> that's the state of the industry yeah yeah no it really is like you know the first ever job I got I remember one of my biggest fears when I um got into journalism was redundancy I was like what will I do if I made redundant oh my god it just sounded like such a scary thing and then it happened and then once it happened it kind of wasn't so scary but um so that meant that when I was like sort of going through that transitional period I became a lot more open-minded and a lot more sort of um Things that I thought I'd never ever do, had no interest in, didn't think I'd be physically able to do, I started doing or, or looking into because I was like, well, this is the opportunity for me to kind of... Give um, examples. What were they? Give examples. I mean, I went to work at Channel 4 News. Like, that was, that was something. Like, I've never considered myself a hard news person by any means. I also have never considered myself a technical person. Um, so I went to, you know, I 
right after um, my first job I was made redundant from, um, essentially it wasn't even as straightforward as being made redundant. The actual site ceased to exist um, <laughs> after a year, which is what happened at my last job as well, um, at the pool, um, the women's publication, that also just you know, like essentially fell apart. Which um, So yeah, um, with my second job, I went to work at Channel 4 News and I was like sort of cutting up videos, doing, doing like technical stuff and it was kind of because I didn't really have the luxury of being like, I kind of want to write about my opinions um, at the moment because during that period of time, um, it was just very difficult to get a job in that sector. And yes, yeah, so I went to Channel 4, um, learned so much. It was like a really, really um, great experience and but also very challenging. And yeah, I do think without sounding too much like a motivational page, that kind of you know these difficulties can really become at least in a creative sense like some really um, amazing opportunities but that also being said I am trying to um, really not shy away from the fact that you know then this period is probably going to be quite testing and quite yeah. difficult hard and scary yeah. yeah especially in terms of like a financial sense and I don't want to rom romanticize it too much because I know that like I'm out here like painting all this stuff and having a great time well not having a great time for sure but like you know having a n normal time hula hooping but then at the same time like um you know I've got savings I know a lot of people don't necessarily um or they're not as secure essentially so um I, I guess it's kind of like a mixed yeah I think what I've been doing instead of necessarily thinking about my life in a career sense is I've been looking a lot at um I guess trying to define myself outside of my work because I kind of have the opportunity to. So I've like, you know, things like art, which I hadn't done for years um, because it's not financially lucrative for me. <laughs> um, I've just kind of abandoned it because I've kind of been in that hustle mindset where I'm like, well, if yeah. it doesn't make me money, I'm not doing it. Um, but now I'm like, um, oh my gosh, I, I'll, I'll show you guys in a minute, actually. I've yes. created- Come, come, come. I'm get it in. <laughs> Give me one second, I'm gonna go get it. Come back with it. Do you come back though up here um but i went and i made uh, a sculpture that will make me absolutely no money because i'm not going to sell it because i love it so amazing much. look how clever you are thank you so much but you know it's not something that i'm doing because i think it's gonna you know help me in any way except other than mentally <laughs> so i'm trying to get back in touch with things that i do because i like doing them like hula hooping like sculpting not everyone has that luxury but i feel like if you do have that luxury it's definitely a good time to get in touch with things that you that you like then that so awesome and it's so true how do we i think one of the challenges um for me at the moment is we're all on the hustle right you know yeah. it's in our dna and you don't do the things that you have done and we're going to get more onto the pivot and i'm writing on the book what you've done with that and so we kind of we'll chop through that but take it as a given for those who are listening who don't know the story it's incredible but it takes a lot of hustle and it takes a single-minded focus on your career focus on frankly making money focus yeah. on you too on monetizing your brand and there's a lot that i can relate to in that because it's kind of you know in a different way what anna and i have to do and it feels a bit like cheating on your hustling self to yes. get out the hula hoop or produce an incredible piece of art and you're clearly hugely talented, but we can neglect the other sides of our personality in our quest to succeed and deliver on our goals. So you, you're obviously balancing different sides to the you. How does that feel if you're neglecting one part of you in order to focus on the hustle? it's it's um it's like a con a constant um tension i'd say um like with art i swear to god sometimes i'd i'd wake up and be like oh wait a minute i i can actually draw like it was something i completely forgot i could do because i just had i genuinely before um i did a painting like last year but before that and that was literally at the advice of the therapist who was like you know you should you should really take some time to do some stuff for yourself that doesn't like equate to work essentially so that's why i did that again like somebody had to had to tell me to do it because i just would have never painted again but before then i don't think i'd done anything artistic for at least a decade um and that used to be a really defining part of my personality 
and like when you look at it when it goes to like when you look at things like I don't know at school or whatever and you know everyone kind of draws at like young age and everyone's into sports at a young age and then we kind of get to this point where it's sort of okay if you're really good at drawing or if you're really good at sport you should actually like follow this up professionally but if you're not then it's not really something you should do. exactly like you know just put down the put down the like you know knitting needles and paint do you know you put away the easel like there's no there's no value in it if it's not something that you can monetize and I think um yeah like I it did feel like a constant tension because I always felt like something was kind of off I suppose because writing for me started out as exactly the same way as art did I just liked it I was just like this is fun I started a blog um like 2012 just because I had loads of stuff to say I had no journalistic aspiration which I know is something people hate to hear <laughs> because I think with um journalism it's a very kind of you were born wanting to be a journalist and it's really outrageous that you've become a successful journalist without <laughs> <laughs> it honestly does irritate me I'm almost kind of like god like there's so many people that I know really wanted wanted to be journalists for ages but it just wasn't my story I wanted to be um I think an artist at some point I probably didn't really want a real job <laughs> like, but I just as much as I remember I wanted to be an artist but um yeah like so once I kind of started um writing it was recreational and then um it turned into a job which sucked about 90 percent of the enjoyment from it because before I'd just be putting my opinions out for my friends then next thing you know they're on the guardian and everyone's being racist to me and sexist to me and I'm like oh wow <laughs> I was just screaming into the void before but now this is actually like you People can reply, and also I have to file this on time or I'm not going to get paid. Yeah. And I have to do this, and I have to run it by lawyers and all this kind of stuff. Um, so that kind of sucked out the fun of that. And I still love writing, but, you know, it. and, I, and I obviously the, the book I co-wrote was with my best friend, um, Elizabeth, you've ever been in it. And, you know, we are truly best friends, as in, you know, like very, very close. And for now, our conversations to sort of pivot from, just talking about inane rubbish about boys and gossip to kind of if we've got this deadline for Thursday it, it again kind of it kind of shifted that as well so I think for a long time I've been trying to kind of navigate um my life in a way that's you know very much dictated by a value system that says if something isn't monetized or if it's not you know pushing you further in your career it's not worthwhile whereas now um which which is why I make a conscious decision to never sell my art I will I'll give my art away if I like do a picture or sculpture of somebody but I don't sell it because I just feel like it's again gonna add that layer of sort of pressure so I feel like yeah I'm just trying to like without sounding too hippie-ish like just find myself again and you know as much as I'm a journalist and that does define a part of me I'm also lots of other things that don't necessarily make me money but are you know equally as useful and important to um who I am and my identity um yeah I'm getting done a decent amount of therapy this is kind of thing that my therapist wants me to say oh (laughs) I definitely and that's the thing is that I didn't get therapy until it was kind of like I have to get therapy and that's that's kind of what I think we should try our best to avoid because I think um, just like my therapist sort of said, you should probably try and do some things for recreation that isn't just like watching Netflix and scrolling Instagram and maybe, which there's nothing wrong with, but maybe other things that like you like that kind of make you feel a bit more centred and connected to you. If she hadn't told me that, I don't think I'd have, I would have honestly ever bothered um, doing anything creative again. And also if certain things hadn't happened in my life that then led me to a point, like a kind of very traumatic crossroads then again I wouldn't have um got therapy it's always like we're waiting for like if I if we weren't in the middle of a pandemic again I probably wouldn't have returned to art because it's like we're always waiting for these dramatic things to give us permission to kind of take a break or like you know catch even friends I haven't spoken to in years it's like oh god we didn't see each other last since college well we're in a global pandemic so like let's Let's get on house party (laughs) Um, let's talk a little bit about goals Anna and I did um an Instagram live yesterday on goal setting how you do it do you do it should you do it um yeah do you set goals for yourself I I do actually now. It's so interesting because before I would honestly say probably pre-slaying your lane, I wasn't. I wouldn't say I wasn't an ambitious person. 
I just don't think I knew exactly what direction I was properly going into. So I couldn't really be ambitious because I didn't really know what I wanted to do. Even whilst being a journalist, I still was just like, whoa, I can't believe I'm a journalist. Well, this is great. So I kind of didn't really see beyond that. And then when we did Sang Your Lane, I was like, okay, wow, like there, you know, the sky's kind of the limit and stuff. So that's when I really started being like, you know what, I'm actually going to try and set some goals here um, and not be afraid to kind of think about where I'm going to be in about, um, you know, um, a few years time. In fact, Elizabeth always used to say, you know, like, so she doesn't really even set goals like every five years. She's kind of like, where do I want to be in like three months time? It doesn't have to be yeah. massive, but just always kind of checking in on what you're doing. And um, I think as well, another thing the pandemic's kind of done is that we, I don't think we often check in about why we're doing something. We're so often kind of just on airplane mode and just doing because we're supposed to. And we don't even certain goals when it's like, I want to have kids by 30 years old. I want to own a house by 32. That's completely fine. the next level that you should be at is this so like I'm constantly like Elizabeth trying to check in on like what I want why I want it and when I want it and um it kind of keeps me a bit more um I suppose focused than I used to be but also making sure that my wants aren't necessarily shaped by the fact I've seen somebody else do something on yeah. Instagram maybe I should be doing that it, do you know what I mean I think it's good to kind of check in with yourself and be like okay do I, why where do I want to do this? Yeah, where does this fit in with my life um, goals and why, essentially? Um, so let's talk about Slaying Your Lane, which is an amazing achievement. Huge congratulations and just, you know, a round of applause for it and its title, which just was smashed. Okay, let's just do that. How, how did you come up with that one? Because it was genius. Thank you so much. So, funny enough, what happened was Elizabeth, so it always starts with Elizabeth <laughs> because it was her idea. The whole book was actually her idea. And I, I've told the story a million times, but she pitched the um, story to me. Not story. She, I'm literally in journalism mode. She pitched the book to me and um, was like, you should go and write this thing. It's um, great. Like, you know, like this is this idea. You'd be great for it. And I was kind of like, wow, this is such a brilliant idea. Like, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know why she's like gifted it to me. It's definitely something that we should do together. And with the... Um, title weirdly it was like again same kind of synergy thing because um we always just send each other like completely random captioned or often like captioned with exclamation marks just pictures of like black women that look amazing and we'll just be like oh my god like just send each other random pictures and like often they're of rihanna usually um often of their of beyonce but this time it was Solange Knowles this time and elizabeth just sent me a picture of Solange Knowles like a massive red fur coat at fashion week I think it was Fashion Week Paris. And then she just captioned it, Slaying Your Lane. And I think about a week before was when she'd called me and said, oh, this is the idea I think you should do as a writer. And I was like, no, let's definitely do this to get together. But we've been trying to find um, a book title. So hard. we were going to put Black Girl, Black Girl Bible, which is now the sub Black Girl Bible, which is the sub title. Um, but when she just said Slaying Your Lane, I remember I called her immediately and was like, Elizabeth, that's the name. That's the name of the book. And she was like, do you think? I was like, 100%. Um, that's why she's the, like, marketing brains, because she, like, yeah, she's always just saying stuff that's very, like, I'm like, you should make this a domain name or whatever. Like, <laughs> um, But then, yeah, literally after that, we got the, um, we literally went on Twitter, we went on Instagram, we went on Facebook, we bought the domain for .co.uk and .com, because, you know, you just hear something, you're like, this is, this is it is rubbish which it should sell it so so yeah um uh, so writing a book together anna and i wrote our book together like we just yeah. been together how did you do it i can tell you how we did it but how, how did it actually work <laughs> how did it work i'm getting flashbacks oh wow yeah. like war like literally war flashbacks it was like um god it was just such a process like we're very lucky because like um we have a lot of obviously it's very good to like love your friends and like like your friends but we have a lot of i'd say um proper respect for each other yes which it's the most important thing the most important and underrated thing because people are just kind of like yeah i really like love this person and i have a lot of time for them but i'm like you know if you don't respect them then you don't respect their ideas and you can't then like if you have a difference of opinion 
you feel like your idea has precedence or your idea is better because you don't respect where they're coming yeah. from. You have a lot, like a real baseline of just like, you know, the fact she even came up with the idea, um, the fact that I was able to see like that name's great. We we have respect each other's perspectives. So writing it, like I, I always say like there's, you know, I think the misconception is like we agree on everything. We agree on a lot because we have very similar um, taste. We always say that we go to shops and like, she'll buy like the same top as me but she'd wear it completely differently like that's just kind of how we are but there were loads of things we didn't agree on but I think because we had that baseline of just respecting each other's opinions we were able to kind of like a lot of hurdles I think for other people would have been like insurmountable and like really they'd have butted heads on we didn't right. but like the beautiful process was just <laughs> I think first we were trying to like merge certain things like okay we write you write this paragraph i write this paragraph and we're just like this isn't gonna work so we kind of just i guess veered towards certain subjects that we felt were kind of more natural yeah. to when we amber and i did alternate chapters like, that's what we did exactly and because because it's just so much easier that way and it's like calm. Oh, and, you and it felt very which i which i think is what i'm hearing about you two with anna and i it sounds similar in that there's absolute mutual respect, but we've also got our sort of subject areas. So actually, when we mapped it out at the beginning and we were like, shit, how the hell are we going to do this? Because it was very much a product of us, but you can't, yeah. how? And actually then when we split out, okay, we think that these are the dozen things that matter. If this yeah. is how to supercharge your career as a woman, these are the things that matter. And it's like, okay, I'll take that one. Exactly. You take that one. It, it just sort of, it was more organic than um, I perceived it was going to be at the beginning where I thought, are we writing every other line? Exactly. It was definitely more organic. And I think like, for instance, like Elizabeth worked in like, um, you know, Canary Wharf in a way more corporate setting. So I think, you know, the workplace chapters, I mean, obviously I still worked in like a workplace, but I think, the workplace chapters, she did the majority of those. Um, and I did the representation chapters being in the media and stuff. And I think um, it just naturally just migrated towards certain um, topics and it worked really well. Um, and I think, again, like you, one thing I always say is you don't have to agree on everything. I think you just have to be able to like sort of see the other person's perspective and say that like, even if I see something one way and Elizabeth sees something another way, it, it, we can both sort of look at each other's perspective and say, well, she's not stupid. So if she sees it this way, there's merit in that opinion. I might not agree with it, but there's still merit in it. And I think that's why we were able to kind of like, you know, um, just go our separate ways, do our own thing. And it came together like in a way that I think most people felt like it just been written by one person. Yeah. Um, yeah. We covered a lot of ground because we have a lot like very um, similar opinions on something. It but needs a sequel. Oh, well, you know. <laughs> You know what? Like, <laughs> Let's get the publisher on the phone now for picture. No need to see Because things change. Things change, right? Definitely. I'm um, for sure. I just think, oh, that's the thing. <laughs> We're just kind of waiting for the, for the you know, global crisis to be us. You know, other than that, we're, we've got some stuff that we're, you know, working on, but um, we'll see. We'll so see for if a little we'll while, you, you two became sort of national treasures, didn't you? Oh, you do, and I love that. Like you very, well. you're a, you know, you're everywhere. You're a national treasures. You How about. does that feel? Uh, surreal. Right. Very strange. Not just strange because um, <laughs> it was just in and of itself strange. But I think I can see like seen a couple of people from my university in this um, live, and they would absolutely be able to attest that. Um, no one, I don't think anyone kind of looked at us and thought this is something these two girls from Warwick University would do because we just weren't those kind of people. <laughs> like, what were, you, what were you like? Um, mostly drunk, <laughs> mostly, mostly drunk, mostly in fancy dress, mostly arguing like with each other and everybody else. So, it, I don't think we were necessarily the first port of call in terms of like inspirational like content i really don't think we were um i think i certainly i'm not offended when people are like whoa i'm really surprised you guys did that because as individuals we kind of have our own like i guess i guess maybe it would have together as a, as a unit yeah, like I, I i i definitely um was surprised um that we did that but also that a book that is hot pink and that says the black girl bible 
was being held up by like you know white men on the tube that yeah. <laughs> well, well no okay, okay give me an example so the first give me an example of seeing an incredibly unlikely person reading the book and did you say that's my book oh my god um so i've never in my life come across somebody just reading the book on the tube which really annoys me because everyone else does um people always send me like oh i just saw this person on like reading it in public i've never seen that but what did happen is when we um we were radio for book of the week and um we were really afraid because we're like this is going to go to a completely dem different demographic than we're used to no, we we, yeah we were we were a bit afraid because we're like i mean i'm very like numb and desensitized to like um trolling at this point in my career but i was still nervous because i was like elizabeth was slightly more new to it so i was like i hope she's not like kind of overwhelmed by like any response we get. so once it aired we got um a note i remember seeing a notification on our account from um an, a twitter app that said at that white bloke and i remember just thinking <laughs> he's not going to be a natural fan i was like oh here we go he's gonna like god knows what he's about to accuse us of like where's the white girl bible reverse racism i was like poised like ready for like my you know response and then he was just like, I just want to say, I've been listening to Selenia Lane on um, BBC Radio 4 and I was like, oh, dot, dot, dot. And he was like, and it's incredible. Like, you know, this is so important. We should be giving this out in schools. And I was like, oh, thank you, oh, that white bloke. I really wasn't expecting that response. But, you know, that was that was very um, surprising and just very, um, yeah, heartening. But I think, like, you know, Sadiq Khan said he's a fan Cheryl Sandberg emailed us um and said that she like did it which was ludicrous because you know Lean In was the like inadvertent inspiration for Slane Lane Elizabeth and were you like oh how you know but I mean Cheryl thank you for your kind <laughs> do you reply like honestly i think we're practically in tears especially because as much as she was the inspiration and we both were really like i think she's incredible we had sort of we had mentioned that you know the reason that the book had come about is because we felt that while Selenium was like it gets a lot of flack but we do feel like it definitely really like started a conversation we also kind of mentioned however that like women of color and black women um weren't necessarily part of that conversation and so when I saw the email, I was like, oh, shit, is she, like, going to be annoyed? But she, she was like, this is great. And, you know, my response was so gushing. I'd actually be so embarrassed to read it back. But I remember <laughs> But it is Cheryl Sandberg, so I think that's fair enough. <laughs> um, so as, um, as a writer, and the two of you as a phenomena, and um, part of and leading the, the way in what is really a movement and has become a movement, what can we learn from that in terms of how to create a platform, how to connect the issues that you care about that keep you awake at night, it, yeah. that give you goosebumps, that give you rage, that you know, into mm -hmm. a platform that then enables you to build a brand and a business? Try and dissect that a little bit if you can for people who are watching and wondering. Yeah. What, could they do this how do how do you do it i know that you've got this incredibly um wonderful and charming sort of series of serendipitous moments but if you can but you're obvious you've obviously got a steely core yeah right. sure. so, so unpick it a bit for us for sure well i think in terms of saying your lane uh firstly being very blessed to i guess have another person that shares that vision so clearly um me and elizabeth are like i guess the one thing that people may have acknowledged and noticed perhaps at university that we've both had is we're very passionate like we're very very passionate people um and that thing you said about things keeping up at night like I felt so bad for Elizabeth like doing the first kind of year of like um the book because she'd wake up um in the morning and have literally about 40 different whatsapps from me about things I'd seen and things that we should do and xyz and you know we were just the business partner oh god and it's crazy it's the from that time so that was crazy like we both lived together and um, literally, I'd sort of open the bedroom door sometimes and she'd open the bedroom, her bedroom door and we'd be like shouting across from each other like in our rooms being like, yeah, we should do this. It was crazy. Like, it was like we became almost manic with, um, you know, just like passion for it and just was, we believed in it so much. So I think what's well, that, again, very cliche, but passion is like key. But I think also just not being afraid to just like be that, that sort of person that's going to prove a market that's not necessarily existing because like, when we went to publishers 
um we you know it's well known publishing is like it's a it's a bandwagon industry it's very much about it's very trends led and we would go in and sort of say like this is our idea and then when we put in our proposal like you know competing titles it was like books that you know we didn't reinvent the wheel but there definitely wasn't anything out there that basically was doing what we're doing for our demographic and in that way so we were kind of like pulling out books that were completely unrelated to what we're doing books like lean in and girl boss and um thrive and stuff like that because we kind of had nothing to compare it to but that didn't make us afraid we didn't feel like you know i remember once i'm um, in, in a meeting with an unnamed publisher they sort of said would you be willing to um what's the word change your um you know we love the idea but would you be willing to change it so that it was for women of color generally and we were like this does a disservice to women of color who aren't black and whose experience is completely different because when you look at like asian women for instance often their experiences in the workplace and the stereotypes that um they are faced with are completely opposing so like black women will be stereotyped as angry and then asian women will be stereotyped as super docile um it's the three bears effect it's a really interesting stereotype about how whiteness is set as like the default and just right and everything else is an extremity of the two so we were like if you want to kind of say that we should we believe that like somebody should write a type of slang on a book that speaks specifically to the Asian female experience so that they don't feel like they're being shoehorned into a book that you know I mean it's really 120,000 words <laughs> to start with but we didn't want it to be like you know just so we can get that book deal we're gonna like shoehorn yeah. this you know of course there are ways that you should amend your vision I mean for a start the front covers were initially meant to be yellow and our public fourth estate were like we think it should be pink and we're like you know what you guys have made a brilliant point um yeah, we were happy to go with it. But we I think on when we heard when we got the email, um Helen Garland Williams, our editor, who's like a genius, she was like, I think that you know, I'm just mocking it up, you know, you guys have your vision. They very much let us do what we wanted. They were like, You guys have your vision and we completely believe in it, but here, you know, here's this it could be like this. And we were kind of begrudging and annoyed that they were right, like shit, it actually does look very pink. But yeah, because we had to change our whole Because <laughs> we had a whole thing about the pink. Sorry, I've just got our book on my um, table. And that, that was our compromise. Like, oh, was it a compromise? Purple, sort of pinky orange and blue. Because we just couldn't, we couldn't quite stick, agree to like, <laughs> see that's what we were worried about. We were like, shit, like, what if one of us thinks yellow's better and the other one thinks pink's better? What are we going to do? But again, that's the thing. We have such a great relationship that I think even if that had been the case, we'd have worked it out. Um, but yeah, like we, we really stuck to our guns and we felt like the fact that we're dealing with a demographic that is so underrepresented in the publishing industry kind of worked in our favour because we could go into meetings and say, you're not going to tell us how to write a book for black women because we're actually black women. Um, you're not going to be able to kind of like steamroll and say, this is what, how we think you should write. And I think what happens is in publishing that often happens where, you know, someone will come in with very specific, you know, but because they really want that deal. So they just kind of compromise it. And sure. we all compromising, but we were like, we can't do a disservice to our demographic. Black women need to read this and know that like, this wasn't, we weren't puppets. Like this wasn't like um, a big publisher exactly like basically pulling our strings to say this is this is what what we want you to do so um yeah i think it's really important to just kind of like obviously be open to compromise but not in the not in the way that you're doing it to i wouldn't even it's not even just about selling out but doing it so that just because you feel like this is the only opportunity you're going to get because with we we had some conversations with certain publishers that you know to us just immediately told us they didn't understand what we we're trying to do um and the fact that they didn't understand that what we're trying to do if it meant it was published i remember we were saying if we have to self-publish it we'll self-publish it if it means it's published in 2020 which thank god it's not because because of this <laughs> <laughs> well, they were all reading a lot yeah um what do you think but you know what i was looking the other day because i was panicking about my future and it was saying that you know ebooks are really up but like hard because i think of amazon deprioritizing hard books like you know paperbacks and stuff are super down i was like geez this is, this is a terrifying time to be an author but it's a terrifying time to be in anything so you know um yeah so 
let's talk a little bit because you and I could go like this forever, I'm sure. <laughs> but I can send you back to your sculpting and me to my spreadsheet. Um, sisterhood. Yes. Which is a really important topic for Albright. We have it written in neon and the entrance halls to the buildings. Talk about what that means for you. You know, obviously you've reflected a bit on your relationship with Elizabeth, but mm -hmm. sisterhood and the sort of sisters in your life. And also role models, you know, we've, you've referenced the <laughs> sort of Beyonce um, sweet, but yeah, he's everybody's obviously, but you know, get, but give me a bit more on that sisterhood role models the women in your life sure um so every time i like have a birthday or have an event which means like different friends from like parts of my life come together like everybody every single time comments on just like how great my friends are because i just have the most like supportive genuine like just interesting amazing i know everyone says this but like genuinely i have like the best friends in the world i mean one of them flipping changed my life like by you know give literally gifting me a book idea and i'm always saying that's just so indicative of like um i wish elizabeth was here because then like i could be like see i am nice about you all the time <laughs> <laughs> she you can know. watch it back for 24 yeah. hours i'm gonna tell her and be like look like i'm always singing your praises but um, yeah, because I was saying it's like just so indicative of the kind of person she is. The fact that she was like, here's a book idea. I think you'd be better at it. And I was like, no, actually, I wouldn't be. Let's work together. And then we created something that neither of us could have created alone. But even outside of like work and stuff, like most of my friends, funny enough, are like not industry people, which was very interesting because like Elizabeth, I used to kind of bitch constantly about the like... Um, media industry and how it was just really weird and everyone was really like strange and i didn't really like it and then now it's like she's been like pulled into this like same industry with you. yeah but like most of my friends um like i i've known since you know like school i've known for a, a very long time and i think it's just it's just amazing because it's just like they kind of have no often like very little like um proximity to the the industry that i'm in and just like the level of kind of pride and support you have for things that like they don't necessarily um on a day-to-day -day basis engage with it's just amazing like they're so supportive of just everything i do and also very um very much like keep me like the same i think like if it wasn't for my friends i could have probably like you know i've seen people get like overly egotistical and gassed over less so i could have probably like just flown off like a massive hot air balloon and been like oh i'm amazing because i did the thing whereas my friends just like they've known me for so long like they just really kind of keep me myself um and like provide a very external perspective on things that i'm doing because they have no kind of vested interest beyond caring about me and then literal sisterhood like my two sisters um are literally my best friends like slaying your lane i dedicated it to my um oldest and our younger sister Yemisi and Yinka whose name all whose names both begin with Y as do my parents on a weird Kardashian thing that we're doing everyone's name begins with Y we've all got the same initials it's strange but yeah like my sisters are like my best friends my older sister's a journalist um at BBC Africa and like w even though I said I had no journalistic aspirations it's interesting how like you know my representation was literally a girl with the same basically same name as me that looks exactly like me that went to work at the guardian and went to work at bbc and i guess when i did make that choice that i wanted to go into journalism i could literally look at somebody who was just like me from the exact same background yes. and same household and managed to do it and i thought yeah like i yem yem's doing it and she's like amazing and like maybe i can do it too so yeah my sisters are just both of my sisters are incredible um and i love them so much um but all of my friends have just been yeah like it's crazy they've just been so supportive and i think it's just such an important um thing to just have those women in your life that like kind of when you don't have that you know self-belief they kind of have it for you and on your behalf so um i've been very lucky when it comes to friends i really have for sure okay so let, let's wrap up with tell me what's next then what's next for you and you and elizabeth and what's next for slaying your lane and what's next when we're allowed out of the house okay so what's next for slaying your lane um we had a anthology coming out in july called um slaying your lane presents loud black girls um an anthology of 20 black british female writers who were just going to write about 
you know, what's next, um, what to what it is to be a black woman in the country today. I guess Slain Your Lane was a bit more past tense and a bit more sort of present, whereas this is like right. looking at the but that has, because of coronavirus, been moved to October, which I'm not mad about. It's Black History Month, so that that's fine by me. So that will be now out in October this year. And then we've got we're launching a podcast finally. Like this is an exclusive. I don't think we. This is like I hope I don't get in trouble because the press. <laughs> we won't tell anyone apart from everyone. Yeah. Well, it launches next um, Friday, April twenty fourth, and we're very excited about that because. Um, yeah, I think so much of our Slain Your Lane work is quite um, serious and a bit like shoulder paddy and panelly. Whereas generally as people, um, yeah, we're, we're not really the most serious people. So I think we're kind of looking forward to trying a bit of rubbish um, with a sprinkle of inspiration in it. So, yeah. Is it just you two or guests or how? what's the format? Um, just us two for now. Um, primarily because we talk a uh, like literally a lot like we've broken some records i think the longest we've been on the phone before is about six hours so, <laughs> so for now we're just it's just going to be um me and elizabeth but what very likely like um depending on how it goes we'll be having guests and stuff so yeah i'm looking forward to it. i'm excited right we will keep our eyes out for that thank you so much for joining i feel like we could do a whole other one have well, to both of you back together or we'll get elizabeth back and then she can say yes, no things about you. but yeah probably give her one so she can say some nice things about me when <laughs> <laughs> um right thank you everyone please thank make sure you. that you tune in again thank you for doing this and um, so uh, my next instagram live is next tuesday at 3 p.m where i will be speaking to the extraordinary gina miller uh, oh, wow. on financial resilience and that i if you've heard her speak before i she gives me goosebumps so do tune in and listen to that one Please do get in touch with any feedback and other themes that you'd like to see us cover and other awesome people. If you miss any of our events, do check out our Instagram TV and join our Albright Connect platform. If you haven't done that already, why not? You should have done. Sign up to Albright Connect.